Let's learn about p-values in five levels of complexity. So p-values are used in almost every scientific paper. We might see a paper say, the new drug showed a significant improvement in patient mortality compared to the placebo group, with a p-value of less than 0 0.001. A p-value is the common language of all statistical tests. If we really understand what a p-value is, we can understand statistical results even if we don't understand all the mathematical details behind the methods. So when we're done with this video, we'll understand why this p-value being very small tells us that this drug works. So let's understand p-values in five increasing levels of detail. Level one, you're one in a million. So a p-value is a measure of how weird our observed data is. We'll learn the exact definition in a minute. But let's think about someone's height. So suppose you meet a guy who is really, really tall. You might say, you're one in a million. One out of a million is 0 .000001. So a small number means that you're very weird. A small number indicates that we are surprised. Now, suppose that you meet a guy who is completely average in height. You might say, you're the most average person I've ever seen. Everyone is weirder than you. 100% of people are weirder than you. The probability of being weirder than you is one. Here, our p-value is one. So a large number closer to one means you're normal, not weird. A large number indicates we are not surprised. So the giant, who is one in a million, has a very small p-value, and the average person has a p-value of one. A p-value close to zero means you are weird. We will only be interested in p-values that are small. So any p-value over 0.1 will basically always be considered boring. Level two, percentiles. So let's take a look at percentiles of height. Someone gets measured at their doctor and finds out that they are at the first percentile of height. How weird is this? Well, if we define weird as being abnormally short, then they are in the top 1% of weirdness. Only 1% of people are as weird as them. So one out of 100 is 0 0.01, 1%, 0.01. These are two ways of expressing the same thing, but usually in statistics, we use the decimal 0 0.01. Now, similarly, someone gets measured at their doctor and finds out that they are at the 99th percentile of height. How weird is this? Well, if we define weird as being abnormally tall, they are in the top 1% of weirdness. Only 1% of people are as weird as them. So 0 0.01, again, is our p-value of how weird they are. So the first percentile and the 99th percentile, in a sense, are really the same. They are the top 1% of weirdness, just in different directions, depending on whether high or low values are weird. So again, this would be our p-value, 0.01, 1%. We also have this thing called two-sided test, where sometimes weirdness happens in two directions. So if we say that both of those people are in the top 1% of weirdness, then there are actually 2% of people in the top 1% of weirdness. We can see that here by these two green areas, which add up to 2%. Well, it doesn't really make sense to say that 2% of people are in the top 1% of weirdness, so we should double the percentage. They're really only in the top 2% of weirdness. So someone in the 1 percentile of height is really only in the top 2% of weirdness because we have to account for the other direction. And someone in the 99th percentile of height is only in the top 2% of weirdness because we have to account for the other direction. Level 3. P-values as tail probabilities. In statistics, when computing a p-value, we'll often draw a picture like this, computing a tail probability. So if this tail probability is 0.1, then that means that this value here is the 10th percentile. Now, similarly, if we have a distribution like this and we draw the area to the right, and if this tail probability is 0.1, then that means this other probability to the left is 0.9, and that, that means this value here is the 90th percentile. So percentiles and tail probabilities are really just different ways to talk about the same thing. If we know a tail probability, we can convert it to a percentile and vice versa. Level four, weirdness is relative. What is a null hypothesis? So the p-value is not just any tail probability. It is the tail probability of something specific that lets us know our results are weird. So weirdness is relative. We can see this in the height example. So a man who is six feet tall is in the 84th percentile of height, which is tall, but it's not extremely tall. Whereas a woman who is six feet tall is in the 99th percentile of height, which is extremely tall. And in statistics, we're going to determine what is weird by considering something called the null hypothesis. So since weirdness is always relative, a p-value must be defined for a specific predetermined starting assumption we call the null hypothesis. The starting assumption allows us to imagine what the world would the starting assumption allows us to imagine what the world looks like so that we can say whether what we observed is weird in that world. If what we saw is weird, we decide to reject the null hypothesis. So some common null hypotheses in statistics are that a parameter 
a number that describes the population, is equal to some previously known value. A null hypothesis might be that the probability of heads is 50% when we flip a coin, or that the average height is 66 inches. A common null hypothesis is that all groups are the same. So we might say that the probability of owning a dog is the same for both men and women, or that the average height is the same in the US and Canada. We might also have a null hypothesis about two variables being independent. So for example, we might say that an individual's height is not correlated with their weight, and we might try to find out if they are. So here's an actual statistics example, and this is a one proportion test. We're gonna test our null hypothesis, our default assumption, that the coin is heads 50% of the time. And the alternative hypothesis that we might want to prove is that we're suspicious that that coin is heads more than 50% of the time. The alternative hypothesis tells me that too many heads is what I will consider weird. Only too many, not too few. This is a one-sided test because we are only on the lookout for values that are too high. So we run an experiment and we flip the coin six times and all six coin flips are heads, which might be a little suspicious. How weird is that though? A p-value will tell us. If the coin is fair, this is how often we would see the different outcomes. This is called the null distribution. It's the distribution of outcomes if the null hypothesis is true. So if I flip a coin six times and it's fair, three heads is the most common outcome. Four heads is also quite common. Five heads is a little weird. It happens only 9.375% of the time. And six heads is quite weird. It only happens 1.5% of the time. It is in the top 1.5% of weirdness. Or if we considered both directions as weird, then it's in the top 3% of weirdness because we would have to double. But here we're doing a one-sided test. So regardless, these results are quite weird and they make us doubt that the coin is fair. So we get a p-value of 0.015. Six heads and six flips is in the top 1.5% of weirdness. And since this number is small, it means the data we observed is very weird. And thus we reject the null hypothesis and conclude the coin is probably not a regular fair coin. So that brings us to our full definition of a p-value. A p-value is the probability of observing results at least as extreme as we observed if the null hypothesis is true. And a low value tells us that what we saw is weird. So this is the magic of p-values. Once we understand what a null hypothesis is and that we reject the null hypothesis when a p-value is low, then we can understand the results of a statistical test without understanding the details. So back to the beginning, we saw this example that the new drug showed a significant improvement in patient mortality compared to the placebo group with a p-value of less than 0.001. So our null hypothesis was that the drug and the placebo are the same, right? The null means that nothing is happening. These two groups are the same. That's a common null hypothesis. And what we're saying here is if the drug and placebo were the same, if the null hypothesis were true, then the probability the drug did this well in our sample is less than 0.001. And that's really weird. So we think the drug works. Level five, reject the null when P is less than alpha. And what is a type one error rate? So we think the null hypothesis is incorrect when we see results that are weird. In other words, when the P value is low, but how low is too low? Typically we use a cutoff of 0.05 to determine what is too weird. 0.05 is called the significance level or alpha. The significance level alpha has an important interpretation. It is the type one error rate. When the null hypothesis is true, we make a type one error alpha percent of the time, typically 5%. So when the null hypothesis is true, we do not want to reject it. But when we accidentally do reject it, we call this a type one error. And we don't wanna make a lot of type one errors. So we can choose how many we would like to make by choosing alpha, which is the type one error rate. So let's see that the type one error rate is alpha. So if the null hypothesis is true, we have a null distribution, which tells us what we expect to see. So imagine we saw a p-value of 0.05, where we just barely reject the null hypothesis and thus make a type one error because we made a mistake. The null hypothesis is true. We don't want to reject it. So we only reject when the p-values are smaller than 0.05, right? When our data is at least as extreme as this value that we saw. So for instance, here we would reject because it's more extreme, smaller p-value, more extreme, and even smaller p-value. And these examples are even more extreme. And how often do these values occur? Well, they occur 5% of the time because the probability of being in that tail is 5%. So when the null hypothesis is true, we see p-values below 0.05 only 5% of the time. So we make type one errors and mistakenly reject the true null hypothesis 5% of the time. Here's an example that's a little more concrete. Let's say the coin is fair, our null hypothesis, but our alternative hypothesis is that the coin is not fair. And we run an experiment and we flip the coin a hundred times to test whether it is fair. If alpha equals 0.05, then even when we have a really fair coin, 
we will mistakenly say it is unfair 5% of the time. And we don't have to do any math to prove that. We just know that whenever we set alpha, that is the type 1 error rate. So if we thought that was too many mistakes, 5%, we could choose a smaller alpha, such as 0.01. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe to learn more statistics.